Hello, my name is Lauren Williams, Marketing Coordinator with BSA Life Structures. Welcome to the Indiana Health Industry Forum's Fall Seminar, where representatives from BSA Life Structures will be presenting past, present, and future case studies on labs and research spaces, and how these types of spaces have evolved over time, and most importantly, how to future-proof these facilities moving forward. Our presentation today will focus on three innovative discovery spaces from the past, present, and future. Our presenters include Aaron Detmer, architect at BSA Live Structures, Kay Townsend, senior lab planner and principal architect with BSA Live Structures, Jay McGill, COO at Indiana Biosciences Research Institute, Scott Gilliam, senior architect and design lead with BSA, and Carrie McGovern, Senior Interior Designer with BSA. First up, we will review a project from the past, the Innovation Center at Indiana University. This case study is presented by Scott Gilliam. Hello, everyone. My name is Scott Gilliam, and I am a project architect with BSA Life Structures. The first project that we will present to you today is approximately 10-year-old building designed by BSA Life Structures in 2008 for Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. The project was delivered as a CM at risk uh, with Messer Construction as the manager. It was constructed in 2009 and occupied in 2010. It's a two-story building, approximately 40,000 square feet. It was a fast track construction project and it also was one of Indiana and BSA Life Structure's first lead silver projects. Located at the corner of 10th and State Road 46 in Bloomington, the project was to be designed to be part of a new campus precinct, emphasizing scientific development and progress. Projects currently constructed in this precinct are the Data Center constructed in 2008, the Innovation Center constructed in 2010, and the Cyber Informatics Building constructed in 2011. And although the Innovation Center was constructed prior to the CIB building, the project was to follow the material pallet and be complementary to the adjacent future building. The material pallet consisted of architectural precast concrete panels, insulated metal panels, and glass curtain walls. As the site was predetermined by campus master planning, there were some challenges for the design team to integrate this project with the future plans for the precinct. The challenges with the site planning included providing a space for expansion to the north. The location of the main entry drive from 10th Street moved from west side to the east side. And finally, the challenge of providing a service area on the west side that would accommodate the future CIB building. Designed with a forward thinking aesthetic and inherent flexibility and growth opportunity, the simple building form conveys a straightforward organizational layout. The folded plane connects and defines and frames the building mass volumes. Large expanse of glass curtain walls provide access to natural light for most interior spaces. And a metal panel spine anchors the two shifting blocks into one composition. Back then, building rating systems such as LEED were developed to measure energy performance of the buildings we design. So our now energy conscious clients began to demand for creative and innovative MEP concepts. Some of the concepts included on this project were multiple variable sp speed fans on supply, return, and exhaust, variable speed pumping and control of chilled water, heating water, and heat recovery hydronic systems, Chiller with independent refrigerant circuits with variable speed compressors and staging of air-cooled condensing fans. Sensible heat recovery of exhaust air energy and supply distribution ductwork and lab exhaust distribution ductwork installed for flexibility and locating a heavy fume hood lab in any location. So here's a view of the original layout of the first floor plan. The main entry is located on the east side with a double loaded corridor with program space on each side and exit stairs at each end. The basic floor plan concepts help to organize the building and provide future flexibility. The modular layout that you see can change over time. There is a large meeting room on the first floor that functions as a classroom. 
There's also smaller collaboration areas located in the central spine throughout. At the second floor, the original design was for all open wet lab spaces. There is a flexible core zone that allows for support spaces to be connected to the lab or to the corridor. The equal structural column base sizing allows for equal, easier equal distribution of spaces for future tenants. And this floor was uh, intentionally left as shell space for future tenants. Uh, that means that the MEP systems allowed for the flexibility for wet and dry labs, and it provided a fume hood intensive space anywhere on the floor. Looking back over the past 10 years, the tenant and usage has changed a couple of times, proving that the building and systems are adapting well. Some of the changes have included renovating the first floor for data entry companies, converted most of the first floor office space into large data storage closets. The classroom projection screen was replaced with the LED system. At the second floor, which you're seeing here, it was built out mostly for office suites and a small uh, open wet lab with associated cage wash. There's still some amount of shell storage space that the tenant leases for uh, additional storage. The current use is for digitizing IU data and most of the rooms are filled with crates of paper just waiting to be sent to the digital world. Here are a few photos from a recent visit. The top left is the reception area, mainly unchanged, as well as the first floor was mainly unchanged. The top right, you can see the innovation center uh, classroom. And if you know, each of the chairs are spaced socially distanced apart due to the coronavirus. Down at the bottom, the exterior materials really looked brand new. The metal panel was holding up very well and the precast concrete looked like it was just installed. So what will the building become in the next 10 years when all the digitizing is completed? No one can pre predict the future, but the good thing is the building will be able to adapt to whatever situation the client will need the space for. Next, we will review a project that has been recently completed. Indiana Biosciences Research Institute's new space at 16 Tech's Innovation Building 1. I'd like to introduce Jay McGill, who is the Chief Operating Officer for the Indiana Biosciences Research Institute, Kate Townsend, Principal and Senior Lab Planner with BSA Life Structures, and Aaron Detmer, Architect with BSA Life Structures. They will be presenting IBRI's new space in Building 1. Jay, for those listening in that may be unfamiliar with IBRI, can you tell us about the organization and the type of research that is being done? Sure. Um, the um, Indiana Biosciences Research Institute, or the IBRI, is an industry-inspired uh, applied research institute focused on um, addressing diabetes, cardiometabolic disease, and poor nutrition. We were founded in 2013 by the state of Indiana and Indiana's leading life sciences industries uh, for the purpose of uh, catalyzing collaboration across um, industry, academia, government, and you know, community organizations. Our research, re our researchers are um, driving advances in diabetes care, uh, doing research in substance of abuse disorders and um, working on the creation of the new diagnostic technologies to uh, help improve uh, patient health. Um, our vision is to uh, you know, build a world-class organization um, of researchers, innovators, and entrepreneurs uh, that catalyze activities across the, the vibrant life science ecosystem here in the state of Indiana. Great, thank you. Can you also describe how IBRI chose this initial location at the Biotechnology Research and Training Center? Yeah, after um, we were formed in uh, 2013, we began looking for space to uh, begin our operations. And, um, you know, quite frankly, space, uh, lab space particularly is is quite limited here in central Indiana. And so we came across a, a number of locations um, uh, 
uh, you know, one up on the north side of town, another one, um, you know, quite quite close to the Dow Agro uh, campus. Um, but then the School of Medicine offered us uh, space at the, the BRTC building, um, which provided, you know, uh, adequate space for us to start our operations uh, with fairly minimal modifications necessary. Um, and, uh, you know, the BRTC building was also, um, you know, close to 16 tech and, and, and where our new location would be and uh, all of our stakeholder partners. And so we chose to go in there um, uh, for those reasons. So this facility actually opened back in 2007 for the IU School of Madison. Uh, BSA was fortunate to have been able to design the project for them and to also do the modifications that Jay mentioned uh, for this facility for their, uh, the IBRI test or IBRI um, interim facility. From a lab design perspective, it's sort of the next generation or evolution of the laboratory for the IU School of Medicine. Historically, their allocation of lab space to reach our researchers was based on the research funding that they received. These smaller lab bays were an easier way or maybe a more diplomatic way, I suppose, of allocating square footage. This was also at the beginning of the lab trend of, the, of collaboration leading to greater innovation. You begin to see openings between the labs with the red arrows that we installed for Jay's group. We feel that this collaboration allows for greater innovation. Um, but you don't see the larger labs that you'll see in the new facility yet. So looking at the new building here, uh, this is the first building at the 16 Tech Innovation District. Um, 16 Tech is located just to the northwest of downtown. Browning Investments is the developer and owner of the building. Uh, Browning partnered with Davis and Associates for the construction of the facility. New building, as you see, is five stories tall. It's approximately 121,000 square feet. The first three floors are occupied by IBRI. The IU School of Medicine occupies half of the fourth floor, and then the Central Indiana Corporate Partnership occupies the other half of the fourth floor and the entire fifth floor. In designing the building, BSA had to follow guidelines set forth by the 16 Tech Master Plan and went on site today being the first new building and renovation of the adjacent old um, CEG building is, that's in progress now. It may be hard to see how the building relates to its surroundings. But when you look at the master plan, there's a vision of an urban environment with minimized building setbacks, public plazas, the building stepping and it's massing. So that's our fourth floor terrace where you see above the, the th th three-story dark bronze element there. Um, and they also had material recommendations as well. Um, so when you're looking at the building right now, it sort of has an industrial aesthetic, and that came from the surrounding context of these older industrial buildings. Um, but, so we have this exposed um, large grid system. Uh, that industrial aesthetic is also carried to the interior of the building. It's very apparent on the first floor, and it's also in uh, the second and third floor of IBRI's office spaces as well. Jay, can you tell us a little bit about what drew IBRI to be one of the first tenants in 16 Tech's first building? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, after we were formed, the, uh, the same industry stakeholders that had created the IBRI wanted a, a space or a location where uh, we could all be near each other to enable collisions and encourage collaboration which is one of the founding values of the IBRI. Um, so we went to the city together and dusted off uh, the old uh, plans for an innovation district that is now 16 Tech. Um, it was vital that we, we found a home in central Indiana that um, helped foster innovation, collaboration, and diversity. Um, uh, and so it, it only became, um, uh, natural for us to be one of the first tenants in the 16 Tech building, um, building one. Uh, another benefit of being in building one is that it is very centrally located uh, to our uh, primary partners in industry. 
um, you know, Roche, uh, Lilly, Corteva, Cook, Medical, as well as, uh, you know, the academia here in central Indiana, um, the IU School of Medicine in particular, but also IUPUI, Marion, and Butler. Um, uh, it, was a, it was also important for us to be a part of the emerging ecosystem where um, life science, tech, and advanced in engineering would intersect, um, creating you know, um, uh, opportunities for um, collaboration and, 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 and new innovation. So at the beginning of BSA projects, we have a visioning session with the clients. In this case, it was Jay and his IBRI team, the Browning team and the BSA team. The visioning session is a way of identifying critical success factors for their project. It helps us and sometimes even them understand their pain points. And then we outline what's most important to them in their future space. We use these critical success factors throughout the project to make sure we're meeting their goals and expectations with the finished project. Some of the main themes that we saw emerge, and you also heard Jay talk about that, um, was the need to focus on creating a collaborative environment that would provide flexibility within the lab spaces for their ever-changing research, and also that flexibility within the meeting and conference room spaces. The design had to provide integration and connectivity between the lab and the office spaces, and it was very important to have spaces for shared equipment and resources. All of these criteria would promote collaboration and informal interaction. It's also very important to create this visual connectivity and transparency between the outdoors and the inside of the building. There was a desire to cre create a hub of innovation that was welcoming or partners, collaborators, tenants, and for the community. So that visioning process led to the development of our floor plans and the, the aesthetic feel of those floors. So what you're seeing here on the screen is the first floor. It is the more public floor of the building featuring a lobby to the upper left of the plan that will function as a rotating art gallery uh, with installations by a local artist uh, to the opposite side is the cafe. Um, and then further, I guess, to the south here is the Applied Data Science Center. Um, so this is a space that will allow IBRI to put their research on display and it's visible from the lobby space. As you travel further down the corridor, you enter the common space. Um, and this is envisioned as a hub where building occupants or other tenants from 16 Tech can meet and collaborate on projects or simply be an easy space away from your usual workstation. You can hunker down in one of the booths or the four top tables, um, or it could also be an event, a space for a larger event. Um, so there's the two larger conference rooms that have operable partitions. Uh, those partitions can be opened up and folded to the side. So the space can be reconfigured for varying event sizes. Um, to the southwest here is mostly just the building mechanical rooms, um, maintenance areas, and then there is a shell space, um, which was planned for a future lab, um, but it is for future lab expansion. So these were some of the initial renderings of the first floor. Um, so the image to the left is the commons area, looking back to the lobby. You have the conference rooms with the operable partitions to the left. Um, you see the booth seating in the back. Um, and then the image to the right, you have the cafe space. Um, so in, in the image of the commons, you see the exposed structure and ductwork that's tying in that industrial aesthetic um, from the outside, bringing that inside. And there's also polished concrete floors, and then there's some concrete panels that wrap in certain locations throughout the first floor and the upper floors as well. Jay, can you describe uh, IBRI's vision for the use of the common space, how it will be used and shared within the 16 Tech and the community? Sure. Um, our vision for the space was it to be open to the um, entire 16 Tech community for people to interact both uh, formally and informally. Um, we envision the space to be a place uh, where collisions happen a place where people can stop in and grab a bite to eat or a cup of coffee, 
a place to meet friends, colleagues, or collaborators, a place to uh, host events, um, uh, all of which facilitate interaction and inspire innovation. As Aaron mentioned, the conference rooms uh, can open into a, a large common space, which creates a, um, a you know, an interesting venue for uh, hosting large events, uh, but they can also be closed uh, and host um, smaller um, events as well. Um, the doors along the front of the building, uh, along Innovation and um, Innovation Way, are meant to be you know welcoming to anybody that's passing by or in the community uh, can come on in. Um, of course, the, the COVID pandemic has uh, changed our vision for the time being, but we still believe this will be a place for um, everyone um, in the 16 tech community and the central Indiana um, area to, um, to connect and collaborate um, and innovate. So what we're seeing here are um, some progress photos of the commons area, the image to the left is of that booth seating, tying in some natural elements with the wood and um, graphics that represent nature. Um, the image to the upper right is of the cafe space in progress. And the lower right is um, an image of some sliding acoustic panels that are in the commons area um, that help to break down the length of the space into smaller, uh, more intimate areas. And then we also have a raised platform that can be used as um, a speaker area, but also these uh, sliding acoustic panels can be slid across and you can have another more intimate uh, breakout area. So the second floor is, is the main floor, one of the main floors for IBRI. Um, it has its reception desk here. You then have a small Oh, or not a small, a kitchenette and break area um, that replicates itself on the third floor. You have two conference rooms, a smaller open office area for, I guess, leasable or incubator tenants, and then the main open office area, which has some great focus booth areas, focus room areas that have easy access to, techn to technology. Um, these are meant for some smaller groups to collaborate, and then you have these individualized enclaves that are spread throughout for more focused work. And since Kay was the lab planner on this job, I'll let her describe the, the lab spaces to the south. So as you can see from this graphic, the large open labs have the modular or mobile benches shown in the blue. We specifically designed the labs to be flexible. There are shared or common equipment rooms, autoclave rooms, a glassware washroom, tissue culture room, and other lab support spaces that flank the open laboratory spaces. This layout creates a space filled with natural light. It's got views to the outside from almost every open lab space and open office space. And that visual connectivity was very important as a critical success factor to the project. As you can see by the yellow arrows, there's a very distinct pattern or access that could be allocated within the lab. Although, as Jay mentioned, it's not um, had to be implemented necessarily due to COVID, but the lab could, with this layout, provide a means for a one-way traffic pattern for staff within the lab. The structural system that we utilized was designed to allow for larger open base size and minimize the column locations. Jay, with the amount of space that you have now, what is IVRI's intent of the leasable lab spaces available? Yeah, we, we do have a lot of um, excess lab space and we're thrilled to be able to offer um, that space to biotech entrepreneurs because um, right now there's virtually no available space uh, for them in Indianapolis. So through our partnership with 16 Tech and the 16 Tech Innovation Hub Operator, 1776, uh, we're offering memberships to access our labs, our our shared amenities and services and shared equipment. Um, 1776 is currently signing up members who will have access to all of these um, equipment and space uh, in our building. 
Um, and uh, we still have space available. So those that might be interested, um, uh, uh, please contact 1776. In this photo of one of the main open labs, you'll see that we utilized overhead service panels to connect the necessary utilities to the laboratory benches. Uh, these panels and the spacings of the panels were also organized such that benches can be removed for any, you know, when necessary for floor mounted equipment to be brought in. And the benches could also be rotated 90 degrees within the space until still have access to all the overhead services. So we really designed it with sort of ultimate flexibility. The mobile lab benches are within the interior portion of the labs and we uh, located the fixed casework and the fume hoods on the perimeter or in alcoves to the sides. Um, the colors within the lab were selected to complement the light and bright views and the materials such as the flooring and the laboratory countertops were selected for durability and longevity. This lab is one of the incubator lab spaces and it was designed to be used as a leasable space as Jay mentioned. Um, it has many of the same components as the larger labs. It has access to the shared and common spaces and also has a vi visual connection to the adjacent office area for the researchers. So the third floor is basically a replica of the second floor. Um, the main difference is that you have the vertical opening um, between the second and third floor here. So that provides that vertical integration between the two floors. Um, it's highlighted by a floating conference room um, that has glass on this side, um, and it's just like a really great wow feature of the space. The construction of IBRI's new space was wrapping up during the pandemic. Jay, you touched a little bit about COVID-19 earlier. How have day-to-day -day operations been affected by COVID-19? Well, in the BRTC building, um, we had to limit the number of scientists working in the small confined labs that uh, Kay uh, showed on an earlier um, slide uh, to enable the social distancing in the lab. So we had to work in shifts. Um, we also decided that um, because of the, the desk space uh, that if you weren't uh, working in, in the, the lab, then you shouldn't be in the in the building. Um, so by moving into the new building, our space dramatically increased and um, we don't have to work in shifts anymore because we're able to spread out in the open lab and maintain social distance. Um, our old office spaces, the desks were really small and, and didn't have much space in between. So it was, um, uh, you know, we, we, we basically had to spread people out across any kind of open space. Um, uh, in our new space, our, our workstations are a lot larger. Um, there's at least six people, six feet between um, desks. Um, we have uh, glass panels between all the workspaces, um, so we can accommodate, you know, people here uh, during the day and um, maintain social distancing and. Um, a safe uh, environment uh, during the pandemic. With that said, uh, we're still asking people to work from home um, and to come into office only if necessary. But certainly for the lab folks, um, the new space has enabled them to be able to, to come in for um, uh, their lab operations as well as you know main, be in the office while um, experiments are going on in the lab. Just to follow up on uh, the office area, these are a, a few of the images. So this is showing the reception desk um, with that floor opening between the second and third floor and that cantilevering conference room. Um, then we have an image of one of the cafe or the kitchenette breakout rooms and then the open office setting. Uh, this next image is a great image of one of the third of the third floor kitchenette, um, looking at that cantilever conference room and over to the open office area beyond. 
How do you see this space and its design helping to meet IBRI's mission and goals for the future? Well, this, the new lab design certainly allows uh, us a lot of flexibility to change layouts or to change operations without um, you know, major uh, renovations to the space. Um, you know, so we, we are able to follow the science of the future and um, uh, make changes on the fly, if you will. You know, the building is very inviting. There's a lot of natural light throughout the building. Um, it's in very inspiring in ways that uh, nurture innovation. Um, the space offers uh, unlimited potential for uh, teamwork and, and collaboration. Um, you know, the modern design and, and state-of-the-art technology and, you know, this prime location in 16 Tech has, uh, uh, you know, put us in a very, um, very good position to attract, um, you know, top talent um, to uh, uh, enable, you know, collaboration, um, to uh, grow our organization, um, and, and really immerse ourselves in, in, in a vibrant um, uh, life science innovation ecosystem um, that focuses on improving human health uh, for Hoosiers. Great, thank you. We're so happy to hear that you guys are getting all settled in the new space and enjoying it. And thank you so much for your time today, Jay. We really appreciate you answering our questions about the new space at 16 Techs. Innovation Building One. Glad to be here. Love the space. Thank you, Jay. Our final case study focuses on an innovative project of the future, the University of Notre Dame Engineering Innovation Hub renovation at Cushing Fitzpatrick, presented by Scott Gilliam and Kerry McGovern. So now let's take a look at the future of innovative discovery spaces. The last project we will present today is a project currently under construction at the University of Notre Dame. It is called the Engineering Innovation Hub and will replace the existing student fabrication lab that is located in McCourtney Hall on the south end of campus. The project will expand the aerospace and mechanical engineering program and will combine multiple engineering disciplines into one central space on campus. This program involves a hands-on learning experience for all mechanical engineering. As you can see in the photo, the tools are grouped together by experience level. And as you go through the program, students will learn the different ways of manufacturing by actually using the tools they would use in the real world. The project goals were to expand their current programs with a unique facility that would include the infrastructure to bridge the gap between education and practice. Second goal was to optimize the student's path through product development and manufacturing. And the last goal was to serve as a recruiting magnet for Notre Dame engineering students and faculty. And you'll see, as Carrie will point out in the walkthrough uh, following, that visibility was very important from the outside and in on this project. The site that was selected is in the central part of campus and crosses the boundary of two existing building footprints. The first building, Cushing Hall was built in 1931, and the second building was Fitzpatrick Hall, built in 1977. The project is located on the first floor directly adjacent to the Idea Center, providing a central space for engineering and manufacturing on campus. One challenge with the project crossing the boundaries of these two buildings was that the floor elevations were not at the same height, requiring a ramp to physically connect the two spaces. So here are some interior photos of the existing facility. As you've probably experienced, existing facilities can have their challenges, and this one was certainly no exception. For one thing, the footprint of the project area has had many different uses. It started as a sloped auditorium, and then it was a computer lab, and then it was offices. So the existing infrastructure was a bit of a hodgepodge. Also, some portions of the building felt a bit dated. So how do you design a new, fresh, high-tech space without making it feel like an appendage? This is the corridor outside the project area, which is largely going to be left in place. 
these display cases and the wall behind are being removed and glass will go in their place so that you can see inside. That's where maintaining a similar color palette can help bridge that gap. And it's also difficult when the materials that you need for patching are no longer available. For example, finding brick pavers in this exact size and exact color would be impossible. So we try to make the patching look intentional, like it's always been part of the design. So we're using a black brick paver as an accent along the walls where patching will be needed. And we'll, it will run in the opposite direction so that matching the exact size won't be so much of an issue. The project area is divided into three zones. The social connection zone, where uh, training and discussions are held. This is an active learning classroom. Concentration zones. This is where focused study or specialized tools are provided. And fabrication zones. Fabrication zones are where tools are grouped for light, medium, and heavy manufacturing. All of the equipment in the project will be relocated and purchased for programs that will include analytics, 3D printing, biorobotics, and manufacturing. The whole idea is that this is a maker space and will allow students to bring ideas to market. Here we wanted to share a walkthrough animation of the space with you. So we're starting in the classroom and the idea is that students can learn fundamental concepts here and then they're able to apply what they've learned in more of a hands-on way in the nearby manufacturing areas. This classroom is flexible and then it allows for traditional blended and technology rich instruction with lots of whiteboard space and multiple digital monitors and power in the student tables for personal laptops. And now we're heading into the manufacturing part of the space. You can see the use of transparency both into the classroom that we were just in as well as into the main public corridor to the right. Notre Dame really wanted to highlight this program and put it on display for the people traveling through the building. Another item to note here is the use of signage for the purposes of donor recognition. You'll see digital display monitors throughout the space as well as overhead signage. This is really used as a way to highlight those partnerships that make the spaces, these spaces possible. There's also signage wrapping each column, which helps with wayfinding. You'll also notice that the ceiling structure is exposed. There's a couple reasons for this. One is that simply it's an engineering innovation hub, so why not celebrate the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems that make this building function? Also, not having a ceiling allows for a lot of flexibility when future renovations are needed. This wall straight ahead is a de demountable partition Again, just looking ahead to the likely need for change down the road. The main circulation path is reinforced by a different type of light fixture, as well as tape on the floor to section off the different zones. The idea here is that the circulation path likely won't need to change, so distinguishing that with a more permanent feature like lighting made sense. The tape on the floor is not only used to define the circulation, but it also sections off different zones of equipment. So since that may change, a more temporary solution like taint is used there. The accent colors used in the space are branded to the university, with the rest being neutral in the same tone as the existing facility. The purpose is really for this to be kind of a blank slate to let the equipment and the donor recognition be the focus. Durable materials in a space like this are also very important, of course. So an epoxy flooring will be used that can withstand this heavy manufacturing environment and also be low maintenance and easy to clean. So now let's talk a little bit about MEP design for future innovative spaces. First off, you'll need early discussion on what the space is envisioned to be, and most importantly, what it will not be. You'll want early buy-in and agreement on this, so you can design for the right level of MEP infrastructure without making it cost prohibitive. 
You should plan for what the space may be in the future, but don't invest the capital with the initial build. This is a shell space idea or not finishing out certain parts of the project to allow for future growth or expansion. This does require the thoughtful planning and routing for uh, future MEP systems. Ultimately, you don't wanna build an office building and try to sell to a lab tenant because there's so much money that can be wasted in removing or replacing unsuitable infrastructure uh, to make the space useful for a lab tenant. You wanna start small, but allow room for growth. We want to look for other ventures that would be interested in sharing this type of space to increase usage and efficiency and also to drive the project costs down. Some key concepts for MEP in the future, you'll hear flexibility is the number one thing. Flexibility is key, you know, rapid re, uh, changing of research and researchers means infrastructure needs to be flexible to accommodate change and quickly. It's a priority to avoid lab downtime, so MEP infrastructure first costs may go up, but it will be saved down the road and avoided downtime. It may be difficult to calculate, but flexible MEP infrastructure does have a return on investment. So how to drive sustainability and energy cost savings while maintaining safety in the lab? Uh, the first thing would be to switch to LED lights if you haven't already. Second would be to install occupancy controls for lighting and temperature. And the third, by using uh, low capture velocity fume hoods and increased turndown of HVAC systems, you will decrease energy usage. Finally, don't try to uh, do something new. Technology is rapidly evolving, embrace it. 10 to 20 years ago, many fume hoods were constant volumes, fluorescent lights were the norm, a centralized lab vacuum system was standard and we wouldn't have dreamed of reducing airflow in a lab environment. Well, now we have low capture velocity VIV fume hoods, recirculating fume hoods, LED lights with highly specialized controls, zoned and flexible lab vacuum systems, and lab air quality monitoring devices. Ultimately, energy consumption must be driven down if we will ever meet the AIA 2030 challenge. So what does our future hold for designing these innovative spaces? You may be asking yourself, so where do I go from here? Here are a few ideas. First off, investigate project delivery methods. The P3 or public-private partnerships or the design build delivery method transfers the risk of operating, maintenance, design, construction and rehab costs, financing rates and timing from taxpayers to the private sector. You also wanna reach out to partners and create sponsorships that can aid you in financing these projects and also connect you to the real world. Pre-assembled modules or prototyping will help save time and money on fabrication and will also standardize end products. Ultimately, designing for this increased flexibility will give the building a better lifetime cycle. Electrical busways give flexibility to move equipment around, remove equipment and add new equipment much easier and quicker. Also think about the placement of ceilings. You know, the removal of ceilings in labs will make all the utilities visible and easy to access. Modifications then are much quicker and it's easier to serve the space from an HVAC perspective. So in closing, we just wanted to kind of zoom out for a moment. David P. Haney is the former president of Centenary University, and he recently wrote an article about strategic planning in higher education. Many of his points can be applied to designing innovative discovery spaces as well. He said, we should no longer simply design spaces but rather human experiences within spaces. Taking cue from Silicon Valley when they design products such as the laptop, the mouse, and the smartphone, we need to challenge ourselves to take it a step further. We also need to resist the urge to ask ourselves traditional planning questions like, what do we need? Or where do we wanna be in five years? Instead ask, what problems do we need to solve? shifting the focus away from what's impossible to predict, which is the future, and focusing on what we can do, which is solve problems. And instead of simply focusing on activities that will take place in a space, focus on the results or the outcomes that you want the space to help achieve. These small shifts in our thinking have the potential to make the difference between good spaces and great spaces. Thank you for joining us today for the Indiana Health Industry Forum's fall seminar and for learning more about innovative discovery spaces, past, present, and future. If you have any questions or want to learn more about any of the services BSA has to offer, 
please contact Kay Townsend via her phone number or email address shown on the slide. Thank you.